Assalamu alaikum brothers, sisters and friends and everybody else watching. Welcome to Thought Revolution. In this episode, we're going to do something slightly different. I recently came across an article published on Dawn. Uh, it was entitled Promoting Anti-Science by Textbooks written by Professor Pervez Hoodboy. Now, I've addressed Professor Pervez Hoodboy in previous videos, especially in regards to his understanding of the scientific method or his flawed understanding in certain aspects and, uh, you know, the, the ideas that he has regarding Islam and science and how they don't really work with each other. And I want to touch upon that again today. But before I do that, I want to make something very, very clear. I am not attacking or refuting or, or, or against his main principle or point within the article, which is that he has issues with certain textbooks that have been published, scientific textbooks within Pakistan, you know, and that have recently been published. That may be true, right? We may need to do a better job of promoting or making, you know, more, you know, thorough academic textbooks. That's not the problem. What I want to address is his secondary point. And he does this a lot with, through his, throughout his writings and his articles. He weaves in you know, these narratives and these ideas which are very disempowering to Muslims. right? And I'm going to point those out today. Now, the first thing I want to touch upon is you know, some of the rhetoric he uses. Like many atheists do in the West, they promote the idea of Darwinian mechanism the, or the Darwinian theory of evolution as absolute fact, the cornerstone of science, and it's the be-all and end-all of everything. right? When the reality is it's not. Right. It's the, and, and, and in relation to this, in his article, he says, well, you know, if you remove this theory of evolution, the whole of biology collapses. It's not true. We've had medicine, we've had biology throughout history, right, for, for centuries, much before Darwin ever came around. Right. And it, it worked. Right. So the, the, that point is false. Right. And on top of it, it's one mechanism that we use to to explain the data, the evidence, the observations. There are many other alternatives out there as well. And I'm going to leave it at that. If you want more details regarding that point, you can go to a channel called Darwinian Delusions. I'll link in the description box below. Run by brother Subur Ahmed, and he's done a lot of research on this, and you'll get a whole host of information regarding this point about Darwinian mechanism, what it is, how it works, you know, what are, what are the limitations of it, and so on and so forth, right? So we'll, we'll park that there. But the point I'm trying to make is conceptually, we need to understand that there is this idea that many scientists, especially atheists, are promoting that it's the absolute fact when it's not. And how can it be? When we know the scientific method is based on induction, it can't give you absolute truth. It, can, it, it gives you the closest estimate. It can get very close to the truth. But as far as absolutes, it can't give you absolutes. Right? So therefore, you can't say something. A scientific theory, therefore, is absolutely true. It doesn't make sense. Okay. Moving on, you know, he, he sort of highlights that or he, or he tries to highlight or show that there is a struggle you know, going on within academics, Muslim academics in Pakistan, teachers, for example, you know, they feel a bit reluctant in promoting or speaking about what science really teaches because it goes against their tradition and their faith. And what he tries to show is there's this clear divide between Islam and science. If you are Muslim, you know, you have your religion, you have your faith, you're backward, but there's no progress and science gives you progress. Well, this is not true. And for us to really understand this, we need to understand what science is and what Islam is. And when you have a rough understanding of these two realities, it will no longer be a problem. If anything, you will become a much better scientist. Now, here's why. Science is a tool that we use to observe physical reality, the physical world around us. It's limited to what's observable, okay? Secondly, it's limited to the how. It can only tell us how physical things may work. It can't tell you why they work. It doesn't have a foot in the door when it comes to the question of why, right? And as Muslims, we know Allah is the creator. He is the sustainer. We, there is no power or might except the power of Allah. He is created and controlling everything, right? That's the why. But the how, we may be able to study some of the how. We may be able to study how rain clouds form or how, you know, you know, how the water cycle works and so on and so forth. These are the hows. Simple analogy is imagine your auntie flies from the UK to Pakistan or the other way around, you know, and she bakes you a cake, leaves a little note for you. You come home, you see the cake and it says, you know, to my nephew, with love, I missed you. Right. And now instead of eating the cake, you pick up the cake, you take it to a science teacher or a science technician and you say, tell me everything you can about the cake. Open ended. I'll give you a month. He comes back to you after a month and he tells you everything about the cake, all the physical aspects of the cake, the house, you know, what temperature is breaked out, how many calories in the cake, what are the raw materials and so on and so forth. But can he ever tell you who baked the cake or why they baked the cake for you? Think about this question. And the answer is no. Because that's beyond the scope of science. The why is beyond the scope of science. Now, what does this mean for us as Muslims? Simple. We know Allah is the why. Allah created everything. He sustains everything. And in the Quran, God encourages us to observe the physical world. Look at the camels and how they were created. There are signs in the heavens and the earth. Allah points to us towards these things to study them. Why? Because when we study these things, they lead us to his worship. 
When we study these things, we see the amazing nature of reality and it leads us to his worship. So for a Muslim, we have a much more holistic understanding of this method we call science and how to apply it. That's the power we should have as Muslims when we understand these realities. But what's happening is individuals like Professor Hudboy are feeding off our ignorance. They're feeding, they're really feeding off of it and they're promoting their own narratives. It's disempowering us as Muslims. But we need to empower ourselves because this is what tradition teaches us. And look at what happens when we empower ourselves and we have the correct understanding about these things. Islamic Spain, development, medicine, biology, chemistry, you name it. There was developments all over the place within science. We had people from the West fly over, or not fly over at the time, but go over to Islamic Spain, study, learn the Arabic language, study under the teachers there, the Muslims, take the knowledge back, come back to the West and open universities, right? This is what Islam gave the world when Muslims understood what Islam was and what this blessing of a method that we call the scientific method was. Not to turn science into a God and say, we have science, therefore we don't need God. These are all false ideas we need to really, you know, dismiss and get rid of, okay? Now, the third point I want to touch upon, he shares a really interesting story, right? And this, again, highlights the point that he has this conception that Islam, you know, draws people back down. It pulls people down when science elevates people. He gives us a story of Qari N, his friend, who would wear his shalwar over his ankles. He was a very practicing brother, you know, but he was a maths professor and he would teach mathematics. But at the same time, he would tell his students, you know, Mathematics is not absolutely true. Don't take it as absolute truth. And he was showing this struggle, right, that he was having inside him. And then he got ill, but he refused medical treatment. He didn't want medicine because supposedly he was a Muslim and he's not allowed to have medical treatment. And he went to a Hakim, what you call a natural doctor, who gave him honey and he died, right? Really sad story that he shares. But again, it's rhetoric. He's trying to promote this idea that, look, Islam pulls you down. Science elevates you. When we know you know, from, for example, from the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in many hadith, Bukhari, we find the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that Allah has not created or sent down a disease, except that he's also sent down a cure for it, right? So he's encouraged the Muslims to go and look for the cures to these things. We have another narration, I'll read to you from Sunnah Abi Dawud, where the companions would ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I'm reading a bit further down in the hadith, they said, Messenger of Allah, should we make use of medical treatment? He replied, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he replied, make use of medical treatment. For Allah has not made a disease without appointing a remedy for it, with the exception of one disease, namely old age. Right? Now these are clear, clear narrations, which encourages Muslims to go and find cures, you know, discover cures, find, share cures, take treatment. Right? Not like the story Professor Pervez Hudboy is sharing with us. So again, brothers and sisters, to conclude, empower yourselves. Learn about the true relationship between Islam and science. Learn about what science actually is. Study the philosophy of science so you have a good grasp of it. And only when you really study the philosophy of science and understand our Islamic tradition, can, and I believe this, I truly believe this, can you truly do justice to the scientific method, right? Truly use it for, for its true benefit. And you know what? It's a form of worship. Because if you as a Muslim read this hadith and you know that Allah has sent down the cure, I need to find that cure so I can help humanity. That's a form of worship for you. And that's an empowerment that Muslims have that atheists can never have. Because atheists believe everything came into existence by chance, blind random physical processes, right? So therefore there may be a cure, there may not be a cure in their worldview. They may never find it. It's a very hopeless situation for them, right? For as Muslims, we should be empowered, right? And just to conclude, if I missed the point, I just need to well mention, I said that he's a maths professor, his friend Karian, you know, and he would say, don't take maths, don't believe maths is absolute. Hold on a second. Mathematics is a sign that there must be a creator. How do you explain, explain the precision of mathematics, for example, right? All of these laws that we perceive in the universe. How do you explain this without God? How do you account for these via blind, non-rational physical processes? It doesn't make sense, right? I can go on, but I'm going to stop here, brothers and sisters. Please study these things, empower yourselves, inshallah, and go beyond this, this, this silly, nonsensical rhetoric. Honestly, that's all it is. It's just empty rhetoric. You know, may Allah bless you guys. Jazakallah khair for watching. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.